It's connected with quite a radical idea that we can set the terms of our own shared life and have some um, control of the path that we take into the future, which is inevitably set for each of us in really deep ways by these collective decisions. And so that idea it becomes nothing but some people choosing on other people's behalf or some people doing things to other people if there's not a threshold of political equality among the decision makers, the citizens. Um, and we could start by thinking of that at a minimum in terms of process rights. And I think process rights are, are, are really the hard core of it, voting, speech, etc. I'm Alan Rosenstein, and this is the Lawfare Podcast, November 17th, 2022. American democracy might look healthier in light of last week's midterms, but there's still a lot of skepticism across the political spectrum about how it's doing. From the right, would-be authoritarians cast doubt on elections and of the very idea of liberal democracy. But even those who reject this authoritarian impulse are frequently uncomfortable with the messiness of democratic politics, instead preferring an anti-politics of technocratic decision-making. Jedediah Purdy, a law professor at Duke Law School, wants to defend democracy from its critics and its skeptics. In his new book, Two Cheers for Politics, Why Democracy is Flawed, Frightening, and Our Best Hope, he argues that democratic renewal is both desirable and, most importantly, possible. I sat down with Jed to talk about the book, get his thoughts about the state of American democracy, and chart the path toward a healthier, democratic future. It's the Lawfare Podcast, November 17th. Jed Purdy on Democratic Renewal. So, Jed, I want to spend most of our conversation, obviously, talking about this book. It's this wonderfully rich treatment of questions of democracy and, and how we live together and how we govern each other. But I actually want to start because of the moment that we're recording this, and I should say we're recording this on the morning of, of Friday, November 11th, just to get your reaction to the midterms that happened earlier this week and because of the vote count are, are still happening in a sense, you know, less obviously from the kind of horse race or punditry perspective, but what this latest formal uh, entry into our long democratic process, you know, what that tells you, if anything, uh, about the kind of health of American democracy, which I take to be ultimately the animating concern of your larger project. So it's, it strikes me that every every two years when we have another round of Senate votes, uh, we're confronted with the fact that we compose our national majorities in ways that are fragmented in artificial and counter-majoritarian Ways And part of the argument of this book is that counter-majoritarian usually means anti-democratic. And so that there's, there's a fundamental distortion or disconnect in which uh, national political sentiment or decision doesn't get in any immediate or effective way translated into a governing national majority. And it's sort of an abstract way of saying what everyone has come to appreciate in the last few years, that the Senate badly messes up the translation of public sentiment into the power to make law and gerrymandering in the house does the same. So we look at a really like profoundly artificial and out of focus version of what's at stake in the handful of races that, that we get to that make a difference and that we closely follow. So I think this is true in every American election cycle. Um, each one is kind of a reminder of the ways that we don't really run a decision of a system of popular uh, self-rule. A, a second thing, <clears throat> which is a little more hopeful, and here I'm really just following the first analysis of the midterm results that Nate Cohn gave in the New York Times the morning that we're talking, which is November 11th, which is that in states where the election denial and kind of crazy menace of a subsequent election reversal kind of specter loomed large. Pennsylvania, for example, it seemed that the Democrats outperformed the fundamentals and outperformed their national performance. Uh, and in places where that 
set of stakes was less salient, um, Republicans performed more in, in line with what the fundamentals of presidential approval and um, inflation and economic sentiment would seem to suggest. So that I think is a heartening thought because as a general matter, if there is not majority commitment to majority rule itself, um, to core democratic processes, then the, then the whole thing is in very bad shape. So to the extent that that read is right, that there actually are majorities for continuing to keep democracy working, where it's clear that those are the stakes, that I think is, is heartening. Um, I also think it's heartening that where abortion was salient, um, it tended to help the Democrats good because as a, not only because of my own kind of substantive politics, but because as a general matter, the book's argument, not an original one, is among other things that it's good when elections have policy consequences, policies have electoral consequences and the relation between those is understood. Then the idea that we're actually participating in ruling ourselves through elections has a kind of concreteness and cogency. And although I wouldn't have chosen to have these fights over reproductive rights, I do think that they seem to have concentrated the minds of voters into the thought that they're actually taking responsibility for the next cycle of laws, which is the sort of thing we would, I think, want elections to mean from a democratic perspective. So your, your discussion of ruling ourselves and that formulation, I think, is a nice segue into the first question I wanted to ask you about the book. Um, which is about definitions, which is always a, a good place to start, I think, when you're talking about theoretical concepts like democracy. What to you is the core of democracy? And obviously, it's one of these famously contested concepts where because it's a good thing or because it's coded as good, everyone wants to smuggle in their substantive uh, commitments. So what what to you is the analytic core of of democracy? And is it more than just a simple decision process of majority rule, which I suspect is what a lot of people would say if pushed to give a kind of value neutral, if such a thing is possible, yeah. definition of the term. If pushed, I would say it, it is a um, decision process of majority rule among um, political equals. And the second part is as important as the first and the relation between the two can be tricky. Let's talk about the decision process part just for a moment, because I, I would say this. People recognize that bare majority rule is an idea that doesn't itself contain much in the way of reassurance, sort of moral constraints and guarantees that things won't go off the rails. So there's a very natural, indeed a very, a very human tendency to want to soften that formulation, move away from it, qualify it, say, well, it can't really be that. It has to be something gentler um, and less unsettling. Maybe democracy is an endless conversation. Maybe democracy is how a political community remains open to the future by making no decision final. Uh, formulations like this, move away from what I think is a really important one half of the core, which is that where there are decisions that have to be made because they set the basic terms of how we live together. And lawfare listeners can think of everything you learn in property law, everything you learn in contract law, everything you learn in constitutional law as examples of answers that law gives to questions like who has what, who can use what, who can do what, can they do that to me? The kinds of real world questions and problems that arise from interdependent human existence and which law um, addresses and, and structures. We have to have some answer to the question of how any of those systems are going to be shaped. That set of questions I call political questions. They're ones as to which there's a collective answer, and there's no getting out of the answer. We all, in a way, have to live with it. Even a version that lets people opt out in one way or another is, a, um, is an answer. So I don't think we should shy away from that. Once you say that there has to be a decision, it is inevitable to ask next who makes the decision. And part of the argument of the book is that 
the presumption should be in favor of majority decision on questions of that kind, unless there's a the very good uh, reason to the contrary. But the second part of the definition is equally important. Democracy is an attempt to specify institutionally the idea that the people who live with a set of rules ought to be the ones who make those rules, or at least at least affirm them. Um, it's connected with quite a radical idea that we can set the terms of our own shared life and have some um, control of the path that we take into the future, which is inevitably set for each of us in really deep ways by these collective decisions. And so that idea it becomes nothing but some people choosing on other people's behalf or some people doing things to other people if there's not a threshold of political equality among the decision makers, the citizens. Um, and we could start by thinking of that at a minimum in terms of process rights. And I think process rights are, are, are really the hard core of it, voting, speech, et cetera. So there's, there's a lot there. And one way I want to draw out what you mean by democracy is by considering what the alternatives are. And you begin the book, and I think this is a really arresting way of, of starting the book, with these four different potential futures for, for America. And one of them is the kind of straightforward authoritarian future, which I think we all understand, you know, whatever that is, it's not democratic. There's a kind of sclerotic future of this constant stasis where nothing quite gets done. Uh, and that might be democratic, but not functioning well. And there's a third future that you talk about, which I think is quite interesting because it's the technocratic future that I think a lot of us, or at least think a lot of your, I'm going to assume most of your readers are in the kind of center left, hyper-educated you know, class, right? Um, probably think is a, is a good thing. Sort of rule by experts, whether that's Dr. Fauci or whether that's, you know, uh, whoever's going to solve the climate, the climate crisis. And you put that possibility forward, but not as the optimal one, um, because you view that in itself as anti-democratic. And, and the phrase you use there and throughout the book, which I think is such an interesting phrase, and I want you to unpack it, is the idea of it's a kind of anti-politics. So what, what do you mean by this, what looks like potentially very nice technocratic future of solving our problems? Why, why is that an anti-politics? And why isn't it appropriate for the people in a democracy who I think rationally can say, well, I'm not an expert on COVID or, you know, climate change or what else, you know, whatever the case is, you know, th this may actually may, may be my best way to channel my democratic impulses into a kind of good anti-politics for everyone. Yes, good. I, so I really appreciate your taking us there, Alan, because definitely it, it, any book has its audience. And I assume that readers of this book will frequently be people who like me, um, we're trained by experts and among experts and in a sense are experts ourselves. And to think that technocracy costs us something very significant is not at all to be against expertise or experts. In, instead, it's, it's to have a view about what the relationship ought to be between political decision-making and expert implementation, um, expert design. Um, there's a, 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 a cliche phrase about the issue that goes, experts ought to be on tap, but not to be on top. And something like that is, is roughly right. And let me say, any formulation of climate policy, financial governance, the kinds of topics that come in for expert rule will have profound consequences for the distribution of resources among industries, among regions, among kinds of people, the same for the distribution of vulnerability and harm and security um, with respect to the future of the planet's weather, for example. And if we're talking climate policy for a minute longer, It'll affect the kind of world that we live in, what kinds, which kinds of species will exist, which kinds of landscapes will exist, you know, what kinds of, what kinds of beauty and what kinds of sublimity people will grow up knowing. And all of those value decisions are different in kind from the sorts of things that experts 
can be qualified to decide in a sort of instrumental, rational way. That is in, in the way of saying, okay, you tell me the goal and I'll tell you how to get there. So those are decisions that I would say, if we take the democratic ideal seriously at all, ought to be ones that people are able collectively and deliberately to undertake in the same kind of way that people have been deliberately saying, okay, you're putting the question of reproductive rights to me. And I'm saying, I want to live in a society where the abortion choices is, is protected. That is to say, it, I think there's, I think it, I think the democratic perspective suggests that there is a value and decisions of that kind, decisions of distribution and of value being available for deliberate self-conscious political choices by the people who will live with the results and whose children will live with the results. So this has to do with, I'm going to take this quickly in two directions. One is, is at a very high level. Um, this has to do with partly with how much you think it matters, whether we think of our future as a choice or a fate. I think the democratic idea is very closely connected with the thought that we should be able to think of our future as a choice rather than a fate. And that even a good fate loses something relative to, loses a lot relative to a similarly decent future that we've been able to choose. Now, let me be quickly more concrete in a couple of ways. One is that I think from the point of view of political sociology, sort of just attempting to estimate the future from the present and past, there are real reasons to worry about the stability of regimes like climate regimes or, or finance regimes or trade regimes that inevitably impose a lot of losses as well as a lot of, a lot of gains, distribute a lot of pain, and can be, and I mean, in a way appropriately are, politically framed as never having really been chosen. I think that the economic dimension, it's not the only dimension, of the global authoritarian populist surge um, certainly has some is, is one reason to think that the systems of that kind will not always be self-stabilizing, that you actually may need popular political buy-in. So democracy from this point of view is not just a kind of metaphysical ideal of collective freedom. It's also a uh, part of the ability of, of complex modern systems to self-stabilize by giving people means of consenting to the worlds that they're going to live in. And then the third thing I'd say <clears throat> quickly is that precisely because a lot of these issues are not merely technical issues, as I was uh, sketching with climate, expert bodies will be subject to the kinds of intensive and extensive partisan pressure that the Supreme Court has been, has long been, it's become very vivid of late to progressives exactly how intense that is and how uh, significant the consequences are. And so in a, in a society where the sort of democratic tools are weakened or neglected, there's no reason to think that expert institutions will remain expert even in, in the ideal sense. The kinds of value decisions that get shunted to them will then get caught in a more um, opaque form of partisan fighting. So I think technocracy, expertise is incredibly important, but technocracy um, can't deliver on its own promise. And even its own promise is a significant cost from a democratic point of view. So, so then would it be fair to characterize your defense of democracy on more instrumental than intrinsic grounds. And and here I'm reminded of this, I think, kind of now infamous tweet that Utah Senator Mike Lee sent in, uh, I think it was October 2020, where, where he criticized the idea of, quote, uh, rank democracy and said that really it's not the democracy itself that we care about, it's its ability to achieve human flourishing. And he had this whole thing about living in a republic versus a democracy. And I don't know, we don't necessarily have to get into whether he got those terms right. But I think there is a kernel of truth to what he was saying, or at least there's a kernel, or at least there's a version of the defense of democracy that is in line with what he was saying, which is that the, the reason we care about it is because it leads to these, to these good goals, you know, whether it's a self-stabilizing 
social and economic regime or whether it's a way to check capture of elites. You know, on the other hand, there's also this rich tradition going, you know, all the way back to Aristotle of defending democracy on intrinsic grounds because what it is to be a flourishing person in a society where we have to rule each other and be ruled by one another you know, is to engage in this and that to not engage in it is to, is to, is to lose a, a part of what makes life good. And I'm sort of curious where you fall out or where you fall on that spectrum, though, of course, it doesn't have to be an either or. It can be a both hand. Right. So I, I think what's distinctive about the book, um, if anything, is a pretty strong attachment to the intrinsic idea of democracy and a commitment, really, to recognizing that the institutions we're often invoking and, and even defending when we talk about the health of democracy, like the U.S. Constitution, um, actually present profound problems from the point of view of taking fully seriously the idea that we should be trying to live in a world in which we, in Aristotle's phrase, rule and are ruled in, in turn. So I think, you know, to borrow a, another famous phrase um, from Justice Jackson, if democracy is not a, a suicide pact, and it's important that it be part of a viable system of governance in extraordinarily complex and, and parlous times. So the, the instrumental or consequential best considerations are real, but they're real almost as a kind of, of constraint. And I guess one reason that I point to them, Alan, I'll, I'll say quickly, is that the traditions of anti-politics um, have always worked in sort of two modes. One is to characterize a set of problems as ones that are not appropriately political at all, certainly not appropriately left up to democracy. And the other is to sort of talk down democracy itself, to talk down people's capacities to understand and make responsible decisions together. Um, and to say, in effect, more or less openly, putting the most important decisions in the hands of your neighbors or your fellow citizens, that's, that's totally reckless. Does it make any sense? Actually would be a suicide pact. The reason I went to the point about um, voters seeming to do all right from the point of view of protecting democracy when the protection of democracy was really was salient in this last round of midterms is that it's a, it's another small data point on the on the view that actually people in favor of the view that people are actually more able to do this than they're often given given credit for i think we all have that suspicion um that maybe people can't really do this i mean maybe this is just a pipe dream closer to the top of our minds than we than we might imagine because it really is in the water of of american culture and it's in the water of american elite education which we've been a lot of lawfare listeners have been through i think we should welcome good faith opportunities to to push against it not least because uh what we're capable of as political creatures is at least in part what we think we're capable of and what we're sure that we're not capable of we definitely will not be capable of so l let's now I think get a little more concrete about the sort of the different forms that anti-politics comes. And your book ranges over a bunch of them. And there's a, a really interesting discussion that unfortunately we don't have time to get into, but it's why one reason I encourage folks to read the book. It's a really interesting discussion about economics and the role of um, a certain kind of uh, neoliberal ideology as anti-politics. But in this discussion, sort of especially given kind of our audience, I want to focus on the, the legal system. Um, and its role in anti-politics. And obviously, the, you know, the first thing we might look to is the role of the courts in taking certain questions out of the political process. This role and the, the tensions that come with it are obviously longstanding. I mean, people have been talking about the counter-majoritarian difficulties since the you know, 50s, 50s and, and 60s. But obviously, it's, it's gotten more salient, I think, in the last five years as the, the rightward tilt of the court has, I think, made a lot of folks who used to be much more comfortable with strong judicial involvement a little less so. And, and I want to draw out what your views are and how they fit into the larger argument of your book. And, and one, the first question I want to ask is whether I'm characterizing a, a, your argument correctly, which is you seem to define 
or be, because your definition of democracy is more than just pure majority rule, it involves a certain kind of relationship that we all have to one another. Mm -hmm. To protect democracy requires potentially going beyond simply protecting the formal institutions. And all, you know, it, it also requires a, a thicker conception of what rights the constitution obligates the political process to, to respect. And if that's the case, is, is it fair to characterize your argument as kind of a version of, you know, what used to be called representation reinforcement? Um, you know, I kind of, as I was reading your, your chapter on the role of the court, session, I kept waiting for, for John Hart Ely to pop up because it does seem that that is where you are willing to kind of compromise between on the one hand, some of the more radical calls that, you know, folks like, I don't know, Sam Moyne may make about just getting rid of judicial review entirely and the kind of whole litany of social, political, and economic rights that various groups on the left and the right have, have argued for over time. Is that a fair characterization? That's a very nice characterization. I would add, I'd add one point that I think may be important in, in filling it out. The reason that unlike some um, people that I'm often in in sympathy with, like Sam Moyne, and I don't don't see eye to eye on the question of judicial review, is that I think constitutional entrenchment is uh, of rights, for example, is potentially a profoundly democratic act, but not if we simply get the rights right through judicial interpretation in the way that. Ronald Dworkin sometimes used to write about the idea, for example, so that democracy ended up meaning something like judges making the right decisions based on the constitution about what people, what it meant to take people's um, interests and concerns seriously. I think what makes constitutional entrenchment powerful is a collective decision that says this is our higher law, our fundamental law, and we're going to live by it let's say, for, for a generation. So I think in a constitution that's reasonably open to amendment so that there's an opportunity to push back explicitly and constructively and decisively against a court that takes the interpretation in the wrong direction, like in my view with the money in politics cases, for example, then there's actually nothing wrong with there being higher lawmaking as well as ordinary lawmaking. In fact, I think that's a democratic gain. The problem, I think, lies in a constitution that's both authoritative and effectively unamendable, so that questions about the content of higher law or fundamental commitments become questions of interpretation under pressure from various kinds of partisan capture. And it's, it's that dynamic that I think people like Sam and Ryan Dorfler are talking about when they talk about judicial review, judicial review as this sort of more straightforward implementation of things that the living generation has decided we're going to keep living with, I think would be would be quite a different thing. Look, I I tend to agree with you on this, but I, I do want to push you a little bit because I do find that that when folks begin to argue against or or want to again put some limits on the the role of the courts, um, which again is becoming more and more of a mainstream kind yes. of view on 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 the it happened so yeah, fast it happened really too. fast uh became much more of a mainstream view on the center center left right and to be fair right on the on the right i think folks are discovering that judicial activism all isn't all that bad <laughs> when it's yes 100 right? percent, and it's, it's been clear for about a decade if not more that that was coming yeah but when when, when i see again especially folks on on the left criticizing the courts i'm always tempted to ask well what are you willing to give up in terms of your policy priorities so you, for example, cr criticize living constitutionalism, right? You know the idea that the that that the the court should play this very active role in um, deciding a lot of these issues outside the democratic process. You know, do you, do you think then, just to get concrete, that decisions that a lot of liberals think of as you know, almost sacrosanct, you know, whether it's the Obergefell decision finding a, a a right to gay marriage in in the constitution, whether it's Roe v. Wade, which obviously has been overruled by Dobbs. But you know, which obviously was held up as an important constitutional provision. I mean, do do you think that ultimately liberals have to give up on on those kinds of victories 
um, if they want to take a more principled position on the role of the courts generally? If I may, I'm going to try to, to answer the question candidly, but also nuance it just slightly in, in the sense that we're always sort of, we're always making principled institutional judgments and also sort of concrete moral and political judgments. And, and the second in particular have to be very attentive to the stakes at the moment in the institutions that we that we live under. So to take the example of, of Roe and Dobbs, I didn't want to see Roe overturned for a bunch of reasons that wouldn't surprise anyone. The principles of reproductive freedom and, and reproductive justice are ones that for my whole family are actually really very close to our to our lives and our engagement. But I I do think that questions of that kind should be decided in a way that is more traceable to an actual deliberate decision by the majority than Roe was. Um, I think that the politics following Dobbs has tended to remind progressives that and, and liberals that this is perhaps an issue on which we do better by going to uh, other citizens, even when we disagree intensely, even when we're going to lose sometimes, than by relying on fragile court majorities. So I'm, I was, I felt wretched when I read the Dobbs decision. I didn't say, oh, it's, it's a blow against living constitutionalism. But I do think living constitutionalism with its good as well as its bad, I also celebrated the Obergefell decision, has profound problems of democratic legitimacy. Uh, because I'm a progressive and humane, I, these are not decisions that I want to see uprooted in a way that cuts away people's rights. But I do think that these, that ultimately um, we would be doing better as a democracy and not worse as a humane society if we were able to make both the day-to-day -day decisions and the decisions about entrenching rights in a genuinely democratic way. And let me just say one little thing that I think helps to fill out what I mean a little bit and make it seem a little less maybe abstract than it might. So one, one might hear this and say, sure, fine, but what about women in South Carolina or Idaho um, I'd say we know from the Civil Rights Acts that the right level of government to specify basic freedoms and the basic terms of legislative equality is national. It's perfectly appropriate that there should be a national abortion rights legislation. And actually, I think it's perfectly appropriate that there should be an entrenched constitutional Right. And I think if it had been available to us to have a right of that kind through amendment, we might already have one. And the interpretive leisure domain between Roe and Dobbs wouldn't have wouldn't have meant anything. So in some ways, the whole progress from Roe to Dobbs as the way we got that we got and then lost that advance in personal rights, I think, is symptomatic of doing things in a way that takes power out of the hands of and runs away from majority decisions that we would have done better to, um, to lean into. I want to turn next to your critique of the Constitution as a potentially anti-democratic force. And I think th th you know, there, there are two parts of it. There's the specific provisions of the Constitution. You alluded to some of them at the beginning of our conversation when we talked about the midterms. And here we can talk about the Senate and the distorting effects that it has. We can talk about the Electoral College. You know, there are lots of features of the Constitution that, frankly, by design, this wasn't an accident, of course, that by design limit democracy. But there's a broader sense, and that's what I want to focus on, uh, in which you argue that having a Constitution that is as unamendable as ours, you know, under the Article 5 process, is just so hard to do is itself a kind of affront to democracy. And you suggest, kind of as a thought experiment, um, you know, what if we had a constitution that was rewritten every generation, right, every 25 or, or, or 30 years? And I think this raises the question for me about whether or not 
at core, you know, your your criticism of our current constitution commits you to being willing, at least in principle, to favor constitutional plebiscite. Um, whether at the end of the day, your view is that the constitution, you know, although it is the higher law, is itself subject to the democratic desires of the, well, maybe it's majority, maybe it's supermajority, as as anything else. Um, I mean, I think that's a very defensible view, but I, I do think that is a it's a it's a somewhat radical departure from I think how most people think about the constitution. So I just want to draw that out and make sure that I'm the inference correctly. Great, I, I totally appreciate that. The answer is yes, yes, it does. I think the only way to keep entrenched higher law from taking the kind of path that ours has to partisan jockeying over interpretive theories with massive consequences for people's lives is to think of the authority of constitutional law as coming from its being an act, an enactment of a special kind of political we, the the we of the first sentence of the constitution, we the people. The way to keep that viable, I think, is to make amendment possible. And I think I, I have not yet been unconvinced that the best expression of that living we would be an up or down vote on constitutional language that had emerged from, in my thought experiment, appropriately representative and deliberative conventions. I should just say a tiny thing, then I want to talk more about this, which is a, such a crucial point. My, my sort of thought experiment ideal, I wouldn't say is necessarily to rewrite the Constitution every generation, but to give every generation a scheduled convention process that would open um, the possibility of proposing amendments. And you could have an amendment that says strike and replace everything. It could also be a good sign if the conventions looked in at the Constitution and said everything's fine here. I would expect the reality, if you played it out, would be something um, in between those two. I think you would get an early wave of amendments to do various kinds of things that we think would be a bad idea, like balanced budget amendments, I'm assuming, but also um, proposals to reverse Citizens United and Buckley, um, enshrine some version of of Roe Casey, et cetera, et cetera. Um, And then we'd, then we ultimately we'd, we would, we would decide. So, I guess I'll say one quick thing to say that to say I'm in favor of constitutional plebiscite, which I am for the reasons you give, is not to say that I think constitutional law should simply be dissolved into or subject to ordinary politics. But I think there should be a specifically constitutional lawmaking politics and procedure. And I think that the ultimate criterion there as elsewhere in a democracy, should be the choice of the majority, because I don't think there's a better alternative. One one question I do have about the idea of making our sort of basic institutions more open to reform is is whether or not that, at, at least some margin, undermines the kind of background stability that you need for the sort of deeply engaged democratic process that you're talking about. And and what I mean, in, just to be, because it's very abstract, what I mean to be more concrete is, right, part of the reason that, let's say every two years, we are grudgingly, though some of us increasingly less grudgingly, which is unfortunate, or some of us le- less willing to, unfortunately, which is unfortunate, we are willing to win some or lose some is because we know that ultimately the system that we have is quite stable, so we will have another choice in two years, right? And in a country like the United States, which is you know relatively young, you know lacks a at least formal dominant sort of ethnic or national character, um, you know lacks a formal dominant religion, right? For for which the Constitution functions as a kind of unifying creed. Do do you worry that although making the Constitution more flexible might help? Uh, with that element of democracy, you're getting rid of some of the kind of social preconditions um, for people being able to engage in the repeat or being willing to engage in the repeated game of trading power back and forth. 
And obviously, there, there, it's not a binary, right? So, so there is some margin which that is acceptable or or not. But I'm curious to get your thoughts on that, Alan. It's an incredibly important question. Let me start by affirming: you can't, I think, get consent to ruling and being ruled. That is, you can't get people to stand still for unwelcome decisions um, or to accept the right of other citizens to make unwelcome decisions that affect them without some deep prior level of commitment to the system itself, which I think in a democracy has to be to some extent a a sentiment of, of solidarity, sympathy, trust. You really have to feel that you're in it together enough that you're willing to let other people's decisions go for you for a while, even though you disagree vehemently, and even though you feel or, or are hurt by the result. I mean, democracy can hurt us. Any any political system can hurt us, and there's no assurance against that. So just as you say, and you channeled it really beautifully, the sort of post-World War II and to some extent 20th century American approach to that problem has been to treat the Constitution itself as a sort of source of common identity, a a touchstone, a keystone, really, to being American that keeps us bound into it. And to some extent, it has has succeeded very powerfully. And uh, um, a lot of the lived life of American democracy testifies to this. You talk to students, you talk to friends, people more or less at random about questions of political identity, political principle. The Constitution comes up comes up quickly. It comes up repeatedly. It comes up as a sort of a, a pin that holds us that holds us all together. Something that in a sense sort of has to be true. Like whatever it says it has to be true and whatever is good and true has to be traceable back to it in some way. Some of the writing that Reba Siegel and Robert Post have done about popular and democratic constitutionalism has very interestingly kind of limbed the the ins and outs of this sense that somehow the Constitution could be good or true in multiple inconsistent ways and the inconsistency could somehow itself hold us together. I think that idea, which, I mean, no one can deny as a certain kind of cultural achievement, or at least you would have to have like not a single Burkean nerve in your body, not a single traditionalist nerve in your body to, to be totally insensate to that, to feel like there's no value in it. It's come at a cost. It's come at the cost of mystifying and distorting the content of the Constitution and the role of the courts. It's come at the cost of concealing the political and partisan character of, of what courts do. And it's come at the cost of treating fundamental law as something that living generations are not able to make or pass judgments on, but that has to be handed down to us. It's come at the cost almost of a sort of historical diminution where we imagine ourselves as less politically capable, as always sort of, always heirs <laughs> and never uh, never founders. And I think, I think that it's, its viability is sort of coming apart at the seams right now. If we were to, as we talked earlier about intrinsic and instrumental or consequentialist reasons to be in favor of, of strong democracy. And there has been a instrumental case for this sort of civic religion, the constitutional creed, as Aziz Rana calls it, for a long time, that it was the thing holding us together. But it's not. Now, it's not in people's views of the courts. It's not in people's views of the um, electoral system the Constitution sets up. It's definitely part of what I think of as the democratic gamble to believe that democratic systems are capable, to some extent, of creating and recreating their own conditions of legitimacy and that they don't only live on other inheritances like linguistic or ethnic commonality, imagined communities, kind of shared attachment to kind of to institutions like the Electoral College or the Senate. Um, if that's if that's not true, if if democracies if we if we can't 
in a sense, fight it out and come back stronger, then we really are stuck trying to fight it out while not quite admitting that we're fighting it out within the cramped and distorting terms of the inherited constitution. There are days when I worry that that's the case. I think there are days when everyone who thinks about these things worries that that's the case. But I don't think it's a settled question. And I think the the cost of taking the kind of more diminished view of what we can do is is big enough that we shouldn't be in a hurry to go there. It's a rich book. I feel like we've only scratched the surface of it. But I want to thank you for coming on and talking with me about it. I really encourage listeners to to read it. It has so much, and I'm very, very grateful for, for your time and talking about it. Alan, it's, it's great to talk to you. Thanks a lot for taking the time and, and for being so thoughtful. The Lawfare Podcast is produced in cooperation with the Brookings Institution. You can get ad-free versions of this and other Lawfare Podcasts by becoming a Lawfare Material supporter at patreon.com slash lawfare. You'll also get access to special events and other content available only to our supporters. Please rate and review us wherever you get your podcasts. Look out for our other podcasts, including Rational Security, Chatter, Allies, and The Aftermath, our latest Lawfare Presents podcast series on the government's response to January 6th. Check out our written work at lawfareblog.com. The podcast is edited by Jen Patya Howell, and your audio engineer this episode was Kara Schillen of Goat Rodeo. Our music is performed by Sophia Yan. As always, thanks for listening.